Welcome to For the Record, I'm Shannon Perrine. We are now less than 30 days until Election Day and For the Record is working to learn more from the candidates in some of the top local races. That includes the 17th Congressional District, where Democratic incumbent Chris Deluzio is facing off against Republican State Representative Rob Mercury. This morning, we speak with both candidates to get to know them and their take on the issues. Let's start things off by speaking with Mr. Mercury. I really just want to start by having you tell me a little bit about your Western Pennsylvania roots and tell me about your family. Let us get to know you a little bit. Oh yeah, Shannon. Well, thanks for having me for this opportunity. You know, uh, my family is a Western PA family. Mom and dad uh, grew up here. You know, families have, have roots and ties to the steel industry and the oil fields of Western PA. And then we live in Pine Township in the North Hills. Um, and I grew up in West Deer, uh, graduated from Deer Lakes High School. And my wife and I have three uh, amazing kids, uh, two in high school, one in middle school, in public school, and uh, we own a small business together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, you own a, a shipping business, yeah, right? Yeah, pack and ship store. Yeah, but it's interesting to me that this is your business now, but you came through the military. That's and right. your military background. I, That's want, right. I, I read that you served two tours in Iraq. You earned a bronze star. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about your time in, in Iraq? Sure. So I, growing up, I always wanted to go to West Point and serve the country. Had that opportunity, was thrilled about that. It was the experience of a lifetime. Learned incredible leadership lessons when I was at West Point. Met, you know, friends uh, that I still have today. On, in my sophomore year, 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, so at that point, you know, my friends and classmates, we knew our lives were about to change. And uh, we were all headed to war. So after graduation, um, I was deployed to Iraq after Kelsey and I got married and uh, did a six-month tour, uh, came back. Uh, we started our family, had Mackenzie, our oldest, and then went back for uh, a 12-month tour with a three-month train-up. Um, so a lot of distance and separation. And then I served with a training team, and our training team was responsible for helping with the surge uh, and to train the Iraqis. Um, and that Bronze Star was something that our team was awarded um, as part of you know, my contribution to the intelligence activities that helped to, uh, to uh, take out some Al-Qaeda terrorists. And uh, so we're proud of that service. You know, my classmates um, uh, really served uh, significantly during that time. I lost 14 classmates uh, from my West Point class of 2004, the most since the Vietnam era. But our class is really service oriented. Uh, and I have three classmates now that are in Congress today, uh, one in Michigan, one in Texas, and one in New York. So I look forward to joining them. Yeah. Um, that's terribly difficult that you lost so many friends. And I think about um, how your experience in the military and specifically in Iraq, really, um, you, you would like to be a member of Congress. I'm curious, you would have an impact on foreign policy. That's right. There are some wars happening yeah. all over the world, yeah. um, not just in Ukraine, uh, not just in the Middle East, Africa as well. Yep the continent, and, and when you think about the impact that you'd like to have, how does your military experience color how you would approach foreign policy? Well, the world's a dangerous place, uh, especially right now, uh, following really a moment of weakness in our country after the Afghanistan withdrawal during the Biden-Harris years. Um, and it, that really opened up the door for some bad actors to do some bad things. Uh, and Putin invaded Ukraine shortly thereafter. Uh, they are still in conflict uh, in Ukraine, uh, in hundreds of thousands of lives, you know, directly lost and, uh, and impacted by, by the weakness of the current administration in that moment. Um, I also think that Hamas taking advantage um, of our weakness and uh, going into Israel on October 7th um, and devastating that country many men, women, and children uh, harmed by that, which kicked off this current uh, war in, in Israel. Um, and, uh, and there's other areas that are hot spots all around the globe. You know, I would point us to the Taiwan Strait as well as an area uh, that is a potential hot spot. You know, the way I think about it is the United States has to be strong militarily. Uh, you know, since the post-World War II era, we have been kind of the guardians of freedom. Um, and it's important that we don't abandon that role. Uh, and when the world saw us pull out precipitously from Afghanistan with really no plan uh, and no commitment to uh, that country or you know, the people there uh, or our allies, uh, it really opened the door for uh, many other bad actors. 
as a uh, West Point grad, Army veteran, somebody who served in Iraq, when I was in Iraq looking back at the United States, the perspective that I gained from that experience is incredible. You really realize that we have something extremely special. Um, and it's a high cost if we lose our place in the world, and that includes our ability to defend our allies and defend this country. Would you have voted for the border bill if you were in Congress? You know, I would have to take a closer look. What I didn't like about the border bill, there were some things that I did, was the 5,000 illegal immigrants per day that it allowed um, to still come in. I think we've got to fully close the border. It should be zero illegals that are acceptable. That's really closing the border. So I think we need to still do work on that. I liked the intent, I liked the progress, but I think we still have to go back to work and get that done. Okay, so we do need to talk about the abortion issue. Sure. Um, you're, I've watched your ads, I've watched your opponent's ads right now, uh, looking at the history of your time mm -hmm. um, in the state legislature. Where do you stand on abortion? Well, look, I'm pro-life with exceptions, and I've always stood with women and families, and I'll continue to do that. What's important to know is that as a congressman, I believe that we do not need a one-size-fits-all federal ban on this issue. Um, that states should be allowed to debate the issue and make the decision that's right for that state. And I think that we've seen that happen and it should continue. Um, I also think that it's important that we support uh, women and families with uh, reproductive health care, um, such as IVF, um, such as um, uh, adoptive services, and things that support you know, their choice within the law. And that's where I stand. Okay, but you did sponsor House Bill 904 in 2021, um, and that did seek to change drastically the laws regarding abortion in Pennsylvania. What would you say to voters who think that you would sponsor a similar bill on the federal level? Yeah, and my commitment and voting record are clear. I would not sponsor a, a national ban on abortion, um, and I've been clear from, about that from the beginning. And uh, you know my voting record in the state house um, supports my stand to not demonize women on this issue, and to not criminalize abortion. Um, and you know in a pre-Dobbs era, um, you know talking about um, reducing abortions was something that you know I was interested in and continue to be interested in. Uh, however, at the federal level, uh, we do not need a national ban. Um, U.S. deal. We've yes. seen a lot of folks in elected positions come out against the sale to Nippon in Japan. We've seen Senator Kim Ward say she's for it. Yes. Where do you stand? So I'm for a deal. I want to keep U.S. Steel in Pittsburgh. These are uh, jobs, thousands of jobs for our region. And U.S. Steel is a legacy company here. Um, you know, the union has done a great job of negotiating during this time, but it is time to make a deal. This Japanese company uh, in Japan's an ally of the United States is offering an incredible investment in Pittsburgh and in the United States steel industry. We can partner with them through this deal, which shareholders have approved, to create the next generation of steel making opportunities in the United States. And trust me, we have national defense um, in our minds as well. But Japan's an ally, and U.S. Steel doesn't make defense steel. That's important to note. And so what I'm focused on is the jobs that are here today and that will be gone tomorrow if we let this opportunity pass. Um, and so let's not play politics with something that is common sense. Let the, let's get this done for our region. So your opponent has sponsored this rail safety bill. We had this yeah. terrible thing happen yeah. uh, just across the border that impacted yeah. uh, Pennsylvania. You know, and it really, it really reaches across the country. Yeah. What would you do to improve rail safety in light of the East Palestine derailment? Yeah, that was a tough uh, event and something that uh, the company should be held accountable for. Now, in the state house, I do have a voting record on this. Uh, we passed a rail safety bill. Uh, that two Beaver County uh, state representatives put forward. Um, it got fully passed, um, and I supported um, holding the industry accountable so that it's safe for citizens and that we can still have a good, healthy industry um, as well. And uh, Mr. Deluzio has said uh, that, uh, you know, that I back uh, big corporate and don't want to hold them accountable, but I would just offer my voting record um, as contrast there, uh, that I, 
I do have interest in holding them accountable and making sure that you know their industry is clean, clean and safe. Um, on the other hand, you know his bill was not uh, even brought up for a vote. Um, he hasn't passed a single bill during his time in Congress. You know, I'm somebody who wants to bring us together and get things done for the American people, but most importantly for the people of Western PA. So let's do that. What else do you want to tell our viewers here at Pittsburgh's Action News 4? Yeah, well, thanks for having me, Shannon. And, and I would just say that everybody's voice needs to be heard in this election. This is a big choice from the top of the ticket down to your local elections. And as your congressman, uh, I will always work hard for every single voter and constituent every single day. Uh, and that's what I want your voters to know. Keep it here on For the Record. In just a matter of moments, I get the take from the other side of the aisle, Congressman Chris Deluzio. We're back after this. Welcome back to For the Record. I'm Shannon Perrine. We continue to hear from the candidates in the 17th Congressional District with the election just one month away. Earlier this half hour, we heard from Republican State Representative Rob Mercury. Now let's go to my conversation with Democrat incumbent Congressman Chris Deluzio. Tell us about your Pittsburgh roots. Yeah, I grew up uh, west of the city of Pittsburgh in Thornburg, Allegheny County proud grad of Ingram Elementary in St. Phillips and Canavan. And what shaped my life, which shaped I think a lot of my generation of veterans, the 9-11 attacks happened my senior year of high school. So I went off to the Naval Academy and then served in uniform, leading Americans at sea, on the ground in Iraq. Uh, those values, that time that I was in uniform really shaped who I am. It's the values I try to take to this job in Congress, which I am beyond lucky and honored to get to do. And I'm in my first term. Uh, it's been a eventful two years during my time in Congress, but despite a lot of the dysfunction and chaos I see down there, got a lot done for this region. And I know we'll talk about that, but delivering federal money here, I mean, more than a billion and a half federal dollars have come to this district since I've been the congressman. I've helped more than 2,000 constituents cut through federal bureaucracy to get federal money they were owed. That's important work that I think gets lost when folks just focus on the big partisan fights down in Washington. What's so special about your district? It's the best in the country. <laughs> it really is. And look, my district, it, it represents our region, but it looks like a lot of the country. I've got neighborhoods right up against the city of Pittsburgh. I've got mill towns. I've got suburbs. I've got farms. And this district's competitive. Democrats and Republicans have to actually compete for votes. That's not the norm anymore. The way we draw the maps in this country, they're gerrymandered in so many states, and that means Voters don't really have a choice in the general election, typically. So I like that this district is competitive. I like that we have a fair map. That ought to be the norm, I think, for our Congress and the country and our state legislatures. I think we would have better representative government if people really had to compete in November for votes. I want to talk about your time in the military mm -hmm. in, in Iraq. Yes. Um, and how that colors today. Yeah. And, and what you do in your work in Washington. Well, what I saw both of my time on the ground in Iraq and my time on the ship, my deployments, uh, I spent quite a bit of time in the Middle East. And back then, this is, geez, almost 20 years ago, the Iranians were the destabilizing influence. I saw that in both of those um, types of deployments. That remains. What we saw this week was the Iranians launched these missiles into Israel. Um, thankfully, the defensive systems seem to have worked. Uh, but they remain a destabilizing influence and even go back before the October 7th attacks. And of course, the Iranians have been influ influential and central to funding Hezbollah and Hamas and others. The Iranians were trying to disrupt the Israelis and the Arab states peace accords, the Abraham Accords, those peace agreements, which have been so central to trying to find a path to peace in the Middle East. So they remain, uh, I think, a, f a fundamental challenge and threat to regional security. And some of the values that I saw and the lessons I learned in uniform, they hold true now that this is a, a government, um, a despotic government that really has, has their eyes set on destabilizing the Middle East and really targeting the Israelis. How does immigration and the problem at the southern border, mm -hmm. how does it impact Pittsburgh? 
Well, that's a good question because most people think this is something that's only happening you know, thousands of miles away. Look, our economy is linked, and I think folks expect and demand that we have order and security at our southern border, that we also have a path for people who want to work hard, play by the rules, pay their taxes, to earn citizenship. Uh, and there was a bipartisan deal that I would have supported. I wrote an op-ed in the Trib about it some months ago. One of the most conservative guys in the Senate negotiated with President Biden. Former President Trump told Republicans in Congress to kill it. He wanted to campaign on problems in immigration. It, it's not just a terrible decision that he made. It goes at the heart of something I can't stand, which is people putting their own personal ambition ahead of this country. Uh, and I think it's something we should have t tackled in my first term in Congress. I wish we would have had a vote on this bill. I would have supported it. There's also other legislation that guys like me support, the Dignity Act. Democrats and Republicans support this. It's about border security. It's about fixing our asylum system and resolving visa issues more quickly. And it's about giving folks a pathway who want to play by the rules, want to earn citizenship, pay their taxes, follow the laws. That's the American dream. I think so many in this region have a history that they're proud of, of their people came from somewhere where things were tough. They worked hard here, it wasn't easy, and they became proud Americans. We can do this. The reality is it will take Democrats and Republicans working together. Uh, let's talk about rail safety. What's the most important part of your rail safety bill, and what's been the biggest challenge to get that passed? I'll start with the challenge. Frankly, there's powerful lobbying against it. Uh, if you look at the coalition who supports my legislation coming out of the East Palestine derailment, which uh, your listeners, I'm sure, remember and know our Beaver County neighbors and friends were right in the thick of things, uh, some within the evacuation zone in Darlington. The lobbying is intense. There are lots of corporate forces who do not want my bill to pass, and yet look at the coalition who supports my bill. You've got on the Senate side, J.D. Vance and Bob Casey, uh, Democrats and Republicans in the House. You've got a bill that I think might be the only one that Donald Trump and Joe Biden agree about that we ought to pass. So this bill is important. It requires two-person minimum staffing. It updates technology around uh, these defect detectors that could have caught and prevented the derailment in East Palestine. It stiffens the fines when railroads don't follow the rules. It puts money to take action for the FRA, which is the agency that uh, should regulate railroad safety. We ought to get this done. Uh, I think there's a path to do it. We have momentum all of a sudden. So I've, I've had a hard time in the House convincing Republican leadership that we should do this. All of a sudden, we've got some momentum. We've got the chair of the rail committee. That's a little in the weeds. That's the leading Republican. This is a very conservative guy. He has pictures of Donald Trump on his tie. I'm working with everyone to get this thing passed because I think that's what we need to do. And we have to communicate to these railroads. Communities like ours, we're not going to be treated like collateral damage in the way of your profits. You've got to treat us with respect and dignity. It takes some common sense effort to keep folks like us safe. Um, Vice President Kamala Harris has said that she would like to change the approach to uh, abortion in this country. She'd also maybe like to change the rules of Congress to get that done. Would you be in support of that? Well, I won't have a vote in the House given that it's the Senate filibuster, but I, I think in general this filibuster has been used not as a way to create compromise and bipartisan agreement, but to block popular reforms. You look at the polling on gun safety, on abortion rights, on basic fundamental issues around our democracy, you have big majorities and yet we'll have fewer than 40 senators, or 40 senators, excuse me, able to block popular measure. I don't, I don't think that makes sense. I think when people elect a majority, they expect them to be able to get some things done. There's a Republican majority that I serve with now in the House, and there's a Democratic majority, a small one in the Senate. That's divided government. But when there are majorities, I think people expect they can pass laws that reflect what they voted for, and if they do it poorly, they vote them out. Uh, and so I'm open to whatever reforms can strengthen this democracy. I often get into, and I talked about with you, gerrymandering, campaign finance. A lot of those reforms, I think and hope, will make our democracy more responsive to what people actually want to see our government do. What do you want to tell voters about your stance on abortion mm -hmm. and your behavior uh, about uh, what, uh, how that reflects what your thoughts and beliefs are? Yeah, it's a pretty basic one. I think people should have the freedom to make their own decisions. I don't want our government banning abortion and telling women and people over this country they don't get to make their own choices. I think people have a range of views. Voters of faith who might have a moral objection, you name it, but most people want our government to stay out of those decisions. I don't like that Republican and right-wing politicians have really for years tried to interfere in these what I think are very private health care decisions for women, and we saw it in Pennsylvania. You know, the last Republican majority, and my opponent was a part of this, you know, voted 
to amend the Constitution in Pennsylvania to take away abortion rights. He co-sponsored a bill that was a six-week ban where most women aren't even able to get an appointment at that point in their pregnancy to even know that they were pregnant and threatened uh, physicians with prison time. I think that's very extreme. I think it's out of the mainstream for what most people here want, and that is the freedom to make their own decisions, whatever that might be. Do you have any concern that if the Nippon purchase of U.S. Steel does not go through, what could happen to U.S. Steel? Yeah, and I think this leadership at U.S. Steel has shown for a while their willingness to shift investment out of regions like ours where there are strong union protections into non-union facilities like theirs in Arkansas. We've seen that for years. And so guys like me who've raised the alarm of, look, this initial deal that was proposed, and that's the only one that really is in front of the committee in Washington, had no protection for the corporate headquarters in Pittsburgh, had no real protections for the union steel workers at the Mon Valley. Uh, we have to find some path that protects our national security and protects the jobs here. I serve on the Armed Services Committee. I know the Japanese are our important allies. I want to see real commitments that can earn the steel workers' support. Then we'd be in a different place, but we're not, we're not there yet, unfortunately. Tell me what you mean. Do you support the, the purchase of this, of this Pittsburgh company by a Japanese con company? I've opposed it because of what I've seen around the shell company that they would use to own things here. And also, I've seen this company engaged in illegal dumping uh, being found in violation of our trade laws. At the beginning of this, at the outset, they ignored the steel workers who have a contract with U.S. Steel. And so I think there's a path but it has to be working with our region to protect our jobs, protect the steelworkers' agreement, protect the headquarters, and satisfy some of our concerns around domestic production and ownership of steel. What else do you want to share with us today? Look, I'm proud to do this job. It is an honor to get to represent us. Uh, I learned a lesson in the Navy that I often talk about. My team's probably tired of hearing it. Ship, shipmate self. You put others in front of yourself, put the mission first. That's how I do this job. I really always am trying to say what is most important for our region and this country. It's my guiding principle in this thing. Don't go anywhere. There's more For the Record coming up right after this. Welcome back to For the Record. As we wrap up this episode, we want to remind you that you can catch up on all of the latest headlines leading up to the election on WTAE.com or the WTAE app. Just click the Commitment 2024 tab. And you can also watch past episodes of this show by clicking the For the Record tab. That's all for today. Thanks for joining us and have a great week.